again in chapter number one. And uh, we've already uh, dealt with about, three, given about three or four sermons uh, on this particular chapter. And uh, I'm going to try to finalize uh, toward the end of this chapter um, tonight. And so as we're going through here, we've gone through here and, and just talked about basically the proof of salvation. A lot of this has to do with proof of salvation. And what he's doing is he's separating the true believers from those that pretend to be believers. And, and so there's a lot of test in here. And so the first te- the test that we looked at last week um, was the light or the, t- wa- the test of the walk, the test of light. And that is, um, let's begin reading in verse number 5. And we'll go down through chapter 2, verse number 1. All right, this then is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And again, last week, just for review, that first test that we looked at about salvation, what is a true believer? A true believer, it talks about walking in the light. There, there's one thing about saying it. Remember in verse 6, it says, if we say that we have fellowship. So there are some people who claim to have fellowship with the Lord that don't actually have fellowship with him. They've not entered into that partnership, not entered into that relationship with the Lord, but they pretend to be, or they profess to be, but they really are not. And so one of the tests that he gave us is about walking in the light. And again, light, we looked at that word last week, what what did that mean? It does mean righteousness, it does mean virtue, it does mean truth, it means all of those things, but it also is tied to life, and we looked at several verses and, uh, and, and talking about walking in life or that life that Jesus Christ has given us, that life that he put into us. So we walk with his life and we also walk with his light and that light is truth and righteousness. And so a true believer, one who is a really knows Christ as their Savior, is someone who is walking in truth and walking in righteousness and walking in the life that God has given all right, that's the walk, that's the path that he's given. And, it, and as a matter of fact, it's not, it's not just making that claim, but it's making that claim and having the lifestyle to back that up. And then if you don't have that lifestyle to back that up, then there is a problem with that. And the Bible says that you're a liar. I mean, basically is what he's saying. He said, if you, you can claim all you want, but if your life does not match what you're claiming, then, then, then you're, you're telling a lie. And, uh, and so really, uh, for the most part, I'm not saying you can't, no, you're not perfect, that's not what I'm saying, or walk perfect or walk sinless, but it is talking about living habitually uh, a lifestyle that is away from God and habitually uh, a life uh, of sin. And so you can't live that way and be a true believer. And we're going to talk about that a little more tonight as we get into this next test. And so the next test that we get into and again, unbelievers, uh, let's go down to verse number 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So there are some characteristics of an unbeliever. of an unbeliever, And it, that is that they're not walking in light, they're walking in darkness. And so you see that in verse number 6. And then also in verse number 8, if we say, again, another claim here. There's a claim that's being made that they have no sin, or I have not committed sin, or I don't live in sin. We deceive. So not only are they living in darkness, but they're also deceived. Look what it says, we deceive ourselves. In other words, trying to make light of sin or trying to make sin uh, um, uh, well, just making light of sin. I'll just say it that way. Making sin less than it than God makes it. Uh, and so if you, if you do that, uh, then, then there's something wrong with your relationship. The relationship that you say that you have and the relationship you had are not, are not jiving. They're not lining up. And then also in verse number 10, it says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So they are deceived. 
Now, let me just say that there are people who claim to know Christ that are deceived and they actually do not know Christ. And, uh, and I would say to you that there are, in, in this particular case, because he is somewhat dealing with false teachers, uh, we looked at that in the first summer or two that we gave in this, um, but he's somewhat dealing with false teachers. And so there are people who will actually be, it could be a leader in the church, could be a pastor of a church somewhere um, that actually claim to know Christ but their lifestyle does not match their claim and, and they actually are teaching false doctrine and teaching things contrary to scripture and, uh, and the Bible tells us if somebody is like that I'm not talking about misspeaking or, or, or maybe misunderstanding something that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about somebody who is purposefully and willingly manipulating the truth so as to teach wrong all right, that, that is completely contrary to Scripture, then there's a problem with that. And the Bible says the truth is not in them. And uh, you could probably go today and, and turn on the television to some of these uh, religious channels, and you could probably find one or two. Oh, they talk really good, you know, and, and they have some words to say that would be truth, but within that truth is mingled a whole bunch of deception. Um, you have some of these guys that... Uh, that manipulate truth about seed seed money and, and that kind of thing. You, you ever heard that? Uh, where okay, man, you, you, I tell you what, you send me a thousand, God's going to give you ten thousand. You know, there are people out there that manipulate people in such a way and use it in a religious aspect and a religious front, so as to uh, be a con artist. I mean, honestly, that, that that's that's the, that's the depth of it. Um, to be a con artist. And, uh, and, and the Bible says here, if they're doing that, and they're willingly doing that, and they're claiming that they know Christ, then, then actually then what they're teaching and what they're claiming does not line up with truth. Because what is the mark of a true believer that we looked at last week is that, man, they seek after truth. They're seeking truth. They want truth. They want, to, they want righteousness in their life uh, at any cost. That, that's what a real believer is, and that's what a real believer is, and that's the walk of walking in the light. That's the walk of a true believer. So, all right, so now we're getting down to uh, the sin test. So uh, we get here, and so that, that's the characteristics of an unbeliever. Uh, and you're not saved because you say you are. You're saved because of what Jesus Christ has done and the truth that has set you free. Does that make sense? All right, we're going to get more into that. So, uh, let, let's look at what a true believer is in this passage here. So let's go to verse number 7. If we walk in the light as he in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. All right, so the cleansing from sin. So that's the first characteristics of a believer is they have been cleansed of their sin. Cleansed of their sin. And how are they cleansed from their sin? It is from the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that it is not some sin or, or a few sins. What does it say there? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us, cleanseth us from all sin. All sin. It is not bits and pieces. It is all of our sin. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for our sins, past, present, and future. He paid for all of our sins. And, uh, and so uh, the characteristic here is that we have been cleansed. Cleansed. And, uh, and again, part of that is we're cleansed from our sin. And because we're cleansed from our sin, you know what? There is nothing like being clean before God. Being clean. Do you remember when you first got saved and the burden of sin was gone and you felt clean? There was no shame. There was no guilt. I mean, there was forgiveness. There was mercy. There was truth. There was righteousness. And the Holy Spirit was reigning in your life. You remember that? You remember that? I hope you do. And, uh, and we were cleansed. And, uh, and so there's, a, there's also the, the part, that, it, that is salvation, but then there's also sanctification. And that's the part that, look, we let things into our life. And sometimes we, just like Hampton Bennett, you remember he had the white robe on, and sometimes it's hard to keep clean, you know? And we allow things into our life, we allow thoughts into our life, and uh, attitudes, words that come out of our mouth, we allow some of those things. And, uh, but here's the thing. He cleanseth us from all sin. We're going to talk more about this as we go through this. Um, but we, he cleanses us from that. But we have that desire, again, to live truth, to live righteousness, and, and to live in a way that is clean. 
a clean life because we have been cleansed. All right, but then there's another one. Let, let's go down to verse number 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, again, that's talking to unbelievers there or, or to identify an unbeliever. Then in verse number 9, if we confess. So there's another word there. So we're cleansed in verse number 7. But in verse number 9, it says, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have that word cleanse there again in that verse, but you also have the word in verse number 9, confess. And so this is a characteristic of a believer is confession. Confession. Now, don't, don't misunderstand what confession is. You know, there's a Catholic version of this, huh, uh, confession, where you go into a booth and you talk to a priest and you lay out your guiltiness. You know, that is not what I'm talking about. Well, what is confession? And again, this is a test of sin, or this is the test of whether you're a true believer or not. You've been cleansed, and then you, there's a confession. Confession. Now, what is confession? Confession is tied with repentance, but it is also uh, agreeing. And by the way, the, the salvation part of this is the beginning but then the sanctification part of this is something that is continual. In other words, a real true believer is going to live a life of confessing their sins on a continual basis. It, we don't wake up one day, get saved, and we never have to deal with sin again. Or, or we're never going to commit a sin again. You know, we want to be clean before God and we want to live righteous before God. But what does confession mean? I, no, the first thing is, is that we are, are, are acknowledging what sin is. It's not only an acknowledgement of sin, but it is also an agreement of what sin is. All right, so as you read God's Word, if you're in God's Word, and, and the Bible talks about God's Word being a mirror, and if we're looking into that mirror, we're looking into God's Word, guess what inevitably we're going to see? If it is a mirror, we're going to see ourself in this Word. Well, how do we see ourself in His Word? In other words, let me, if, if, you, if I go and look at the mirror, you know, I, I, I remember myself, how my memory, I remember myself as a young athlete. You know, ready to jump and dunk a ball and throw a baseball as far as the field and, you know, all those kind of things. But when I look in the mirror, that's not the same guy that I see. And I began to see these little crow's feet on my, you know, the sides of my eyes. And, you know, and I began to see some scars and some, you know, and, and, some, and some wrinkles and some aging. A little less hair or a lot less hair. Ever how you want to look at that, but... Uh, and so you, you start seeing things like that, and you start seeing things, but it gives us the truth about who we really are. You understand what I'm saying? And so as we look at the Bible, and we look at His Word, and we begin to see something, we begin to see ourselves for who we truly are. And when we see ourselves for who we truly are, look, we're not elevated on a throne somewhere. You know, I mean, we're filthy, rotten, dirty sinners. I mean, that, that's who we are. Now, we've been redeemed. I, I'm thankful for that. But, um, but as we look at, look at the Scripture and, and God begins to reveal things to us uh, about the sin in our life, it could be an attitude that we had. And perhaps at the time we thought the attitude was the correct attitude, but then we began reading and say, hey, I, I handled that all wrong. And, we, and so there may be something that we need to confess or agree with God. You know, there are a lot of people who try to live in the gray areas. You know what I'm talking about, the gray areas of life. Now, remember, a true believer, he is craving righteousness. He's craving truth. But an unbeliever, they still want it. They say that they have fellowship with the Lord, but they still want to operate over here in the darkness, <clears throat> in the gray area, the gray, in the shadows, if you would. There are things that I think God clearly and explicitly says is sin. All right, and there are people who still want to operate over there. If they want to operate over there, that's up to them. But that is just an evidence, if you will, an evidence of who they truly are. 
If we want to operate in sin and we want to live in sin, that's completely opposite than what the Bible says. The Bible says we're going to love truth and we're going to seek righteousness in our life. And so if we're, if we're wanting to operate in sin all the time, then there's a problem here. And the Bible says, look, the truth don't lie in us. It, it, the truth is not there. We don't have fellowship with God. And so there are things that are black and white. But then there are things that are gray. You know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, the Bible doesn't come out and say, don't smoke pot. Can you find a verse that says that? No, I, it, it doesn't say that, but... But, but there are some gray areas. This is what I'm saying. All right, and, and alcohol and things like that, it, it, there are gray areas. And, and it, Now, if you go over and read in the book of Proverbs and you want to you mess with alcohol and you want to mess with that kind of stuff, the Bible calls you foolish. At the very best, the Bible calls it foolish. And so, if, if you, and what I'm saying is, if you are constantly wanting to operate in the gray area, you're, you're kind of wanting to ride that fence. That is an evidence, and this is what the Bible is saying here, uh, of whether you're truly saved or not. Because if you're truly saved, the Bible says, hey, I want to live in righteousness. I want to live in holiness. I want to live in the truth because this is where God wants me. I want to be cleansed. I want to be, be cleansed, and I stay confessed up with my sin. And let me just say, the closer you walk with God, do you realize that the more aware you will be of what sin really is? The more aware you'll be of it. And so, you know, if, if, if there's questions about whether something is sin or not, or whether it's gray area or not, a real believer, if you really have fellowship with the Lord, what is the, what is the default? The default is to stay away from it. The, de the default is to say, hey, I'm going to stay what I know is truth and what I know is righteousness and what I know is holy. Not, I'm going to operate in the gray area or over here in the darkness. And this is what this is saying here. So we have to um, confess is, is acknowledgement of sin. It is agreement of sin. You're recognizing you're wrong and you're pleading. You're agreeing with God and you're pleading guilty before God. In other words, you're looking into the mirror of God's word and God flashes something before your eyes in the mirror that, that you perhaps haven't seen before about yourself, but you're looking at it and he's revealing it. And you recognize that. And you recognize that and... and and you're saying, God, I, I see what you're saying here, and I see what you're revealing to me. And, and a true believer is not going to be one that I'm just going to close this mirror and I'm going to turn this mirror around. The true believer is saying, okay, okay, God, this is what you say is truth. This is what you say in your word. And so I'm going to agree with that. I'm agreeing with that, and I'm acknowledging that, and I'm telling you, and I, I'm confessing. I am acknowledging or I am pleading guilty before you. It's like standing before the judge. When you go before the judge, you have to plead one of two things, right? Guilty or not guilty, right? And so when you stand before, when you stand before the judge and you plead guilty or not guilty, there, you have to either agree with the charge or disagree with the charge. But if you're reading it in God's word, God's word is truth. And if the believer desires truth and desires holiness, like God's word says, then, and, and God reveals something that is not holy and it is not truth, you're going to agree and acknowledge with him. You're going to say, hey, this is sin. You're agreeing with God, and you're going to confess or you're going to acknowledge and plead, hey, I am guilty before God. So that's part of confession. All that is part of confession. In other words, I own it. I own it. How many times have you, have you heard people try to justify their sin in their own life? Well, so-and-so does this. And I'm going to tell you, if you're comparing yourself to other people, you're comparing yourself to the wrong thing because we have to compare ourselves to the Word. We have to compare ourselves to Christ. That's the standard. It's not everybody else out here. Well, I knocked the thing off. Uh, it's, not, it's not everything else. It is Christ is our standard. And so we have to own it. We have to address it in our own life. Not shun it or quit trying not to expose light into that area of life. It is no. We, we, want, we want God to shine every, every area of our life so that we can be truthful, so that we can be honest, so that we can be holy, so that we can be clean before him. And that's part of confession. So we are affirming truth. When you see something and it's sin in your life, you recognize it, you agree with God, you own it, and you affirm it as truth. And then uh, the, another part of confession is repentance. 
Now, it is not just acknowledging sin or recognizing sin. There has to be repentance in that. By the way, uh, repentance, if you remember, uh, and I know part of this is salvation, but uh, what was the message of John the Baptist? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As a matter of fact, and then the same message Jesus reiterated. Jesus said the exact same thing. And from that day forward, this is right after his baptism, he says, and from that day forward, Jesus began to preach repent, the repentance for the, king, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He, he preached the exact same thing, the message of repentance. The message of repentance. And, uh, and so what is repentance? And so we've got, in order to understand confession, and then repentance is part of that, we've got to also understand what repentance is. Repentance is not just, not only feeling sorry for our sin. Yeah, that's part of it. You know, I can go, I can go rob the bank, and, get, and, and let's just say I rob the bank and I make $1,000 on my robbery. And I get caught. Now, I can express sorrow. Am I, sorrow, am I sorry that I went and robbed the bank for $1,000, or am I sorry that I got caught? There is sorrow. In anything that we do, you know, there can be guilt and there can be sorrow for it, but it does not stop there. Let me tell you what repentance is. Repentance is not just feeling sorrow. It is grieving on the inside this is i'm talking about a believer now when we have committed a sin and it is revealed to us through the word or through preaching or through someone through the holy spirit and he reveals to us that it is sin that rep- what true repentance is is that we acknowledge that sin we recognize that sin We agree with God that it's sin, and we recognize that I'm part of that sin, and I have taken part in that sin, and it is grieving me on the inside because sin is now part of me. Because remember, a true believer desires righteousness, desires desires holiness, desires truth, but now I am engaged in sin, and now I am grieving over that sin, and that sorrow and that grieving over sin now that I am, I'm having to leave all that. I'm confessing that, and I'm repenting of that. And repenting means I'm putting it aside, and I am turning from that not to do it anymore, and I'm turning to God to follow Him and to follow truth and to follow righteousness. That's what real repentance is. So we're acknowledging sin, we're agreeing with God about sin, we're repenting of sin. And then, um, let me give you a verse about this in 2 Corinthians. It kind of describes this. Chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 9. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. Now this is talking about repentance. He's rejoicing not that you were made sorry, but but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that if you might receive damage by, by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Again, there's two types of sorrow. There's sorrow that the world has. Oh, man, I shouldn't have done that. And you keep living in it. I'm sorry. But godly sorrow, what does that do? It turns from that and goes to live truth. Verse 11, for behold, the self saved thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Carefulness. Carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, ye, what zeal, yea, what revenge in all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Do you see what, you see what, it's kind of how I described it. There is a great vehement uh, uh, grieving on the inside when you realize that there's sin there. That's what a believer, that's what a believer has on the inside. Because if the Holy Spirit lives there, look, sin and the Holy Spirit do not go, do not go together. Do not go together. And so we express this truth. We agree with God. We, we're grieving over our sin. 
and we're turning from that. And then the next thing is that we seek forgiveness. This is what confession is. We're seeking forgiveness as well. Again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our righteousness. And you see forgiveness being tied with that word confession. All right, so, so there's, there's the two words I've given so far, cleansed, and then also confess. Those are characteristics of a believer. And, and let me just say, now, you know, it is, it is impossible. It is impossible for us to know every sin that we commit. I, I know the Lord, as we, as we grow closer to the Lord, he reveals more and more, and he gets deeper and deeper with us. But there are sins of omission, there are sins of commission that we don't even know about. You know, I mean, honestly. There are attitudes that we have that sometimes we don't even think about or don't even consider. And, and you know, and, and does that mean that we're, that, that we're going to lose our salvation? No, that's not, what, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about, look, the sin that we're aware of and, and we're making that right. This is a lifestyle and a habit of trying to be clean before God, and this is a process that he uses of sanctification, but it is a lifestyle for a believer to, to continually confessing our sins as we live before God and he shines light on certain areas of our life, and we begin to agree with him about what he sees and what he's revealing to us of what is truth, and we want truth to reign in our hearts and our life, so we remove that sin, we confess that sin as he reveals it. Does all that make sense? Okay. All right, so to whom is this? To whom is this confession made? And again, that is to God himself. And uh, over in chapter 2, verse number 12, there's an interesting verse here of 1 John. It says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Why does God forgive you? Does God forgive you because you're so good? Does God forgive you just because ah, sin's not that bad? Is that why he forgives you? No. He forgives us because of his son, because of his own name, because look, the, the promise that we're given in verse number 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise that he made. He's not doing it uh, because we're worthy of it. He's doing it because for his own name's sake. Jesus Christ is already, how is he just in doing so? How is he just in forgiving sin? It's because the penalty for sin has already been paid. If, all right, David, you, let's just say you're, you're traveling down the road and you get a speeding ticket. All right, you're doing 85 and a 60. All right, man, and, and that, that state trooper, he's happy to write you a ticket, right? He's smiling all the way. And David, he's going, man, I wonder how much is this going to cost me. i got to hire an attorney. i got to do blah, 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 all this stuff. Guilty, right? The debt is owed. But let's just say I, on his behalf, I go around David and I say, hey, how much is David's fine? And I, say, and I go to the court and I say, okay, it's $250. And I write him a check or I, I take $250 cash and I give it, to, and I give it to, the, uh, to the court on his behalf. Then what happens with David when he goes to court? He don't have to pay it again. It's paid. All right, and so... This is exactly what Jesus did for us. He paid our debt for us. So he, because that debt was paid, he can forgive our sins. Does that make sense? He can forgive us for his name's sake because of what he did, because of the price that he paid and the promise that he's made to us to do it. And so he is just in doing so. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, and let me just say that, that we're, we're confessing to God, but at the same time, that there should be uh, within that confession, and there's a hatred for sin. Do you have a hatred for sin? A hatred for sin. A continual, and again, because of this hatred for sin and what it does in our life, there's a, a continual confession and repentance. This is the characteristic of the believer. 
Continual confession and repentance. Continually. Uh, Did you confess and repent today? Did you ask the Lord? Look, honestly, you know, when we sing the song, I need thee every hour. How, How long can we go without sinning? How long can we go without having a wicked thought? I remember, don't tell Faye I told you this. I remember one time, we hadn't been married very long, and she had a boss at work. And, uh, <laughs> she, and, and she was telling a thought that she had, all right? And this, this will tell you what I have to live with, all right? And, uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, I don't remember what the boss did. It was something that upset Faye, and this is what she said. She said, I, you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to stab him in the heart with a pencil. That's what she said. Now, she didn't do that. But you, you know the thought that we have. You know what I'm saying? The thoughts that we have. And uh, Now, that was a wicked thought, wasn't it? That was a wicked thought. And so, uh, now, y- y- I know y'all don't think Faye thinks things like that, you know. But she lives with me, all right? So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, no, so w- when we have thoughts like that and, and the Lord reveals to us, you know what, I, I shouldn't have had that thought. You know, I, 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 need to, I need to control those things. I need to have the wrong attitude. Uh, or I don't need to have the wrong attitude. I need to have the right attitude because I'm a believer and I want what's true and I want what's right and I want what's holy in my life. And, uh, and instead, you know, we confess that and we forsake that and we uh, repent of that and we seek forgiveness and that, that becomes our lifestyle. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 7, uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking and he makes a statement regarding this. He, he, Romans chapter 7, verse number 24. He says, O wretched man that I am. Now hold on, the Apostle Paul, he is a church planter. He, as a matter of fact, he says he's free from the blood of all men. That means he's witness to everybody that he came in contact with or that he could possibly witness to. He's starting churches. People are being saved. He's preaching everywhere. He's been beaten, stoned, whipped, imprisoned. You know, gone before councils and gone before judgment halls. Under house arrest, shipwrecked, all for the call to Christ. And look what he says. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? What is he talking about? He's talking about this this body that he has is full of sin that he has to deal with. And it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then that with my mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Again, that battle that's going on and on. And, and he has to live that, that way as well. He had to live the way uh, of a continual confession and, and getting right before God. You remember he said, I die daily. You remember that? What is he talking about? I am, I am dying to the wishes that I want. I'm dying to live truth and to live righteously. That's what I'm dying to. I'm dying to myself to live for him. Um, And again, this is a mark of a believer, is confession. And uh, and then, so there's one word here. uh, What what did I say? I said uh, cleansing, cleansed, confessed, confessing, and then conquering. Look in Bert chapter, let me go back to 1 John, chapter 2. Verse number one, well, let me read nine again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So he's writing these things so that we sin not. So this is conquering. It doesn't mean that we sin just so that we can have forgiveness or where we have the license to sin because, hey, forgiveness is there anyway. You ever met people like that? I can live how I want to because Jesus is going to forgive me. That is not the attitude of a true believer. That is not. I'm going to go back to Romans. Romans 6, 1. And it's addressing that very thought. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, man, God's grace is free. His forgiveness is free. So we can just keep on sinning, right? We can just keep on living in sin. Verse number two, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We've been, remember, we walk in the light. That light is life. Remember, we walk in the life. We're not walking in the darkness. We're not walking in the sin. We're not walking in the, dark, in the death. Verse 3, know you not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. So I, I'm going to stop right there. You get, you get the idea. But we don't live the type of life that says, okay, I'm free to do this and I know it's sin because, look, God's going to forgive me anyway. You, have, you know people like this. God's going to forgive me so I can just do it anyway. That is not a mark of a true believer. A true believer says, look, this is sin. I'm agreeing with God. And I'm going to have victory over this sin because, look, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. And I'm going to live truth. I'm going to live holy. I'm going to live righteous. And I'm going to shun this. I'm going to confess that this is sin. I'm going to repent of this. I'm going to agree with God. But I want truth to reign in my life. I don't want sin to reign because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And that is a mark of a true believer. That I want to live truth and I'm going to stay away from the sin. I, I'm, I, it's not to say that you're going to be sinless. You're going to deal with that all the time. But I'm talking about the habitual things, and as God reveals them as sin, you turn from them, and you turn to God. You confess it, and, and, that's, and that, that's your attitude towards sin. And, uh, and again, that's the victory over it by the, of, of indwelling sin. And by the way, when you begin to, when you're growing in the knowledge and admonition of the Lord, when you're growing in the knowledge of His Word, you're spending time in His Word, and look, you live this pattern you live this way. God reveals sin to you. You agree with him at sin. You acknowledge that it's sin. You own it in your life. You repent of it. You confess it. You ask forgiveness of it. And, and, and you, 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 you put it away from your life. And you do that enough times. And, and you, not to say that you'll never have to deal with it again, but you, you do that enough times. And you walk that pattern of life. And you walk, begin walking closer to the Lord. And you begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit more evidently. You begin to walk in the light more evidently and uh, and this is Christian growth and as you grow in the Christian and you grow this way you become more and more aware of the sin that is in you and the sin that is around you and you do all in your power to avoid it and to shun it and to get away from it and to and to repent of it that is the pattern of life and that is the sanctification process all right and and, and that is the process through which he makes us to be more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. So, so the first test we looked at last week was the test of light. Now, this time is the test of sin. What is your attitude towards sin? Oh, can I play in it a little bit over here and have a little bit of that? I'm going to tell you, if that's your attitude, you need to check up if you're really saved. Because the mark of a true believer, according to 1 John right here, is one that follows truth righteousness holiness and you live a life of confession you live a life of repentance that marks the characteristic of your life as a matter of fact and it says he's writing these things that you sin not you do everything in your power to try to live holy it's not to say that you're going to be perfect but you're doing what you can do to live godly and to live holy and to live and, and to live in such a way that is pleasing to him and that line and your life lines up with your with his word and it's not just over here saying if we say we have no sin, or if we say you're making claims, there's a difference in making claims and living it. And the ones that make claims and don't live it, that's an improper picture of, of a true believer. But if you're making claims, 
about knowing the Lord and walking with Him and sin and confessing your sin, then that, that's, going to be the, that's going to be the lifestyle you have, that, that life of confession and that life of, of living for Him, that life of repentance. That's the lifestyle that you're going to have. You're going to abhor sin in your life. The closer you get to God, the more you're going to hate sin, the more you're going to abhor sin, and the more that you're going to recognize sin in your life and in your heart. Does all that make sense? All right, so how are you dealing with sin? What is your attitude towards sin? This is a test, a test that, that John gives us in his word about false believers, ones that claim to be believers, and ones that are truly not. Oh, it's not ones that truly are. The ones that are and the ones that are not. This is a test. And so you can compare that. Maybe you know people that are this way, and, and you, maybe you need to pray for them. Um, you know, there are some people who, th- who can't live this way. They think they're saved, and they make this confession or profession that they know Christ, but they really don't know Christ, and, uh, and therefore, that's why they always live in the darkness and live in the gray areas. That's why they live there, because they're really deceived. They're deceived into, into thinking that they're saved when they're truly not. And uh, a mark of a true believer is not walking as close to sin as they possibly can. The mark of a true believer is one that is getting far away from sin as they possibly can. That's the mark of a true believer. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we are grateful for your word.